We thank the Lord once again for this uh, morning, for gathering us to be able to hear his word. And uh, I know that uh, our Father, which is in heaven, has uh, blessings he wants to bestow upon us. And what we can just do is to share in these blessings that uh, he wants to give unto us. I want us to start this morning program, uh, continuing with the, our series on uh, justification. And uh, this morning we are going to look at uh, justification, a precious gift. Justification, a precious gift. I want us to pray and then we go a little bit notch higher from the two messages we have heard uh, the first and the second day. And so if we'll humble, we shall pray. Abba Father in heaven, what a, a joyous moment again to come into thy presence and to thank you for thy grace. Indeed, we are indebted to thee by the blood of thy son to give you gratitude and thanksgiving in everything. You have really guided us during the nightly session and uh, in this day as we approach thy very presence to learn of thee, Lord, do not withhold anything that can be beneficial unto us. And so sanctify my mind and uh, open our hearts that we may receive the messages in gladness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, the, the, the messages of uh, justification, I know they are the most uh, precious messages that uh, we can ever have because they really brings out uh, our true picture and uh, presents to us the lovely image of Jesus Christ who can be able to given to us all that we need in this life that is full of sin, this life that is full of destruction. Day one, we looked at uh, justification, the good news, and we saw uh, in Genesis 15, the first prophecy, the first new goods to Adam and Eve after they had just sinned in the Garden of Eden. Yesterday, we were looking at uh, another issue. What were we looking at? Justification. Hmm? Conditions of acceptance. And we saw that in Christ we are accepted. That the Lord does not wait for his children to do a grievous thing. Christ died vicariously on the cross for our salvation. And so in, uh, in his son, we are accepted. And today we want to go a little bit uh, uh, in depth into this message. And uh, i like uh, us to at least concentrate to be able to hear because the message has been elusive in some way. And uh, we, we want to make it so basic, in depth, but so basic to what the message is and uh, how it is profitable and to and to our, our, our lives. And so, the message itself, the message of justification is uh, a most precious message that was sent to the church. And now we, we were laying foundation in the first two presentations and now we want to go a little deeper. In 1888, this message came to the church, the Adventist church. And uh, it was uh, an awakening message because Christ was about just to come and uh, take his children. They be translated. It was designed actually uh, 
to prepare our people to receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which uh, uh, it was the third angel's message in verity, as we say, to prepare people for translation. And uh, when it came to the church in 1888, the message itself was of, uh, uh, was of a deep and lasting uh, impression upon the minds of the people and the ministers. And that is why the message is still talked about today, what happened in 1888, what were the implications, was the message accepted or rejected? And uh, to this day, people are still divided on what happened in 1888. And so we want to look behind the curtains uh, because we have been here for so many years right now. And uh, I see to her that Christ was just about to come, but he has studied for long. What has happened and what is the problem? And so the message was brought in, in 1888 in Minneapolis, but that is not the years that this message started. The message has been there, had been there, but it had not been proclaimed more fully to the people. And so it was accompanied with a package of uh, other messages. You find the, the, the health message uh, was there. The, the divinity of Christ was set forth amongst the people. And uh, this is what is talked about the, in uh, Testimonies to Minister TM, page 91 and 92. TM 91 and 92. I want you to catch the phrases that are, are used on this message. Amen. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people. In his great word, mercy. And Paul says that um, a sin abounded, so grace did what? Much more abound. So Satan had plunged the whole world in a scenario where actually there was no hope, there was no glimpse of light of man overcoming sin. So God in his great mercy, after seeing the wretchedness of man, he sends a more precious message to his people. And this message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted savior. And you no, know, when, when we talk about the uplifted savior. What do we mean? Look at uh, the book of John. Uh, I like to give a verse when we talk about uplifted savior. Uh, John, it will be in chapter three. And I like to read uh, verses uh, 14, John chapter three, amen. To verses 17. I'd like us to highlight verses 14 to verses 17. When we are talking about the uplifted Savior, what is it that um, we look unto? Is somebody there? Yes, go ahead. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That, that whatsoever believeth in him, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have it eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Yes, and then we are talking about... Um the savior who is uplifted the savior as moses lifted up the serpent what what did the israel have to do when they the serpent was uplifted the message was look and live was there anything else did you have to go into the science of how a serpent i can look at the serpent and live can anyone Describe how you can look at the serpent and live. Can you fathom such a such a thing? So the message had to uh, bring more prominently before the world, the uplifted say that the, the issue is look and live. That is what we are being told. And this is why Christians are struggling unto today. 
They don't want to look and to live. They want to do something and live. But the message was look and do what? And live. And why? Look and live. Let us go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians. Why look and live? 2 Corinthians, I'll be giving you a verse in a moment. Verses 18. 3.18 says, But we all, with open face beholding, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So by just beholding the lovely image of Jesus Christ, what happens? We are changed from glory to glory. That is how precious the message was, that man had just to look at Jesus Christ and live. And by beholding the rules of adaptation, so you become. This was the message that had to get prominence among us as a people. And this is the message the Lord is bringing back to the church because the church has been taught to look to man, but only looking at man brings failure and not any glory. And so we are told that uh, uh, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, the uplifted savior who is the sacrifice of the whole, the sins of the whole world, it presented justification through faith in surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Justification in surety, having the faith of Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, from, uh, the book of Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, verses, uh, verses 12. Revelation chapter 14, verses 12. It says, yes. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So in this message of look and live and talking about Revelation chapter 14 verse 12, this is what is written in 1888 messages. 1888 messages or materials page uh, 200 and 17 to 218. I like to read in your presence about looking and living and having the faith of uh, Jesus Christ. It says in 1888, page 217 and 218, the faith of Jesus, it is talked of but not understood. What constitutes the faith of Jesus that belongs to the third angel's message? Jesus becoming our sin bearer that he might become our sin pardoning savior. He was treated as we deserve to be treated. He came to our world and took our sins that we might take his righteousness. Faith in the ability of Christ to save us humbly and fully and entirely is the faith of Jesus. The only safety for the Israelites was blood on the doorsteps. God said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over. All other devices for safety will be without avail. And you see how many times we form other devices of safety. Is it? We understand when we talk about forming other devices of safety. Can we name some of them? The faith of Jesus Christ to save humbly. And it's not only spiritual, but even physical ones, is it? Yeah, because Whoever has told you to worship him also will provide for you the necessities to make you worship him in truth and spirit. So we devise other things. We, we have devices for safety, but these devices are without avail. We trust in our jobs. We trust in our own works. And th these are the things that are actually uh, making us not surrender fully to Christ. You know, as the story we were talking about yesterday, Sister Adler, that um, 
this world is full of sinners and people who don't care about Jesus Christ. And they put us into corners and we think we can devise a way to come out of it. But soon and very soon we'll find out that they cannot. And so you say that, uh, okay, this one Christ cannot handle. I'll try to handle it on my own. But Christ is saying, surrender all to me and then I'll handle everything. And this is, what is the problem? There is salvation for the sinner in the blood of Jesus Christ alone, which cleanses us from all sin. The man with a cultivated intellect may have vast story, stores of knowledge. He may engage in theological speculation. He may be great and honored of men and be considered the repository of knowledge. But unless he has a saving knowledge of Christ crucified for him and lays and by faith lays hold of the righteousness of Christ, he is lost. Some trust in the education, is it? But such an education without Jesus Christ cannot save anyone. So the message had to bring, make prominent the afflicted savior. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person. Why his divine person? Why his divine person? Second Peter, second Peter one four, yes. Second Peter chapter one, verse four. Ray, are you there? Still opening? And you notice that what the Bible says, the prophet also said, uh, says, I want you to look at, uh, because it was to bring prominent the uplifted savior and people to look at his divine nature, his divine attributes and his divine person. Why look at Jesus Christ in his divine nature, divine person and uh, divine attributes? Read Second Peter, uh, Chapter one, verses four. Ray, are you there? Go ahead with a loud voice. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by this we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through love. You remember how we started the presentation? The message was precious, is it? Mm. It was a precious message, and here we have a precious word. We have a precious promise that we be partakers of what? Divine nature. divine nature. So that is why Christ was uplifted to look at his divine nature, to look at his divine attributes and divine person. What we need is a divine nature. What we need is the divine attributes. And we are, talking, we are not talking about omnipresence, omnipotent, or um, omniscience. We are talking about the lovely character of Jesus Christ. By looking at him, by beholding, we become. So the message was precious and unto us, we have been given precious promises that by uh, escaping the corruptions that are in this world, we may be partakers of divine nature. That is how precious the message is. That the Lord doesn't want us to remain with the attributes we have, with the character we have, but to partake of his own character. And talking about uh, this, uh, uh, divine nature. I, I'll give you something, a quote that you can put beside uh, Second Peter 1. For, you know, when I read the Bible and uh, there's a quote, I put it there. And so it becomes easier for me when uh, I'm doing presentations for my studies. Look at uh, Temperance 107.1. Uh, the book Temperance, uh, P.E., 107.1. And this is so wonderful. I'll just highlight it. It says, the savior took upon himself the infirmities of humanity and lived a sinless life that men might have no fear that because of the weakness of human nature, they could not overcome. Christ came to make us partakers of the divine nature. So put beside 2 Peter 1, 4, 
TE 107.1, the exact words. And his life declares that humanity combined with what? Divinity does not commit sin. That is why he had to be uplifted on the cross. We had to look at his lovely person because looking at fellow human beings, there is nothing we partake. We only partake of the same filthiness that we have. But looking at the lovely image of Jesus Christ, we partake of his nature. And so people had been taught to look to human, but now they had to look to Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine persons, his merits and his changeless love for the whole family. And he then says, all power is given into my hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness. And then it says it is the third angel's message in surety. So this is a message, a precious gift that we have been given. Every sentence in the comprehensive statement is worth of most careful study. This message is of a most careful study. And so point number one, the message was a precious message. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people. Point number two, the object of the message, the message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted savior, the sacrifice of the sin and giving us of his divine nature. It presented justification by faith in Shuarit and invited people to receive of his righteousness. Who are the people who needed this message? All the people needed this message. For man could not overcome sin, but now he has one who has conquered sin and he is ready to exchange his life for us. And so by partaking of the life of Jesus Christ, then we partake of this nature every day. Our eyes needed to be directed to Jesus Christ. All power is in his hands. And when he says all power, what does he mean by all power? Is there anything that people go through that Christ cannot be able to satisfy? He has all the power so that he may dispense the rich gifts. Talking about the rich gifts, let us look at Ephesians chapter 4. You know, when Christ saves us, not only does he give us the power to overcome, but the, the, this saving power comes also with the rich gifts. Let us look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4, and uh, in a moment, I'll give you a verse that we can start off with. I'll start from verse 8. If you can start from verse 8, talking about the rich gifts. Wherefore he says, when he ascended up on high, he led us captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he may fill all things. Continue on to verse 13, 11 to 13. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, I don't, I don't know if you understand the package of justification. The package of, package of justification is that Christ, after having victory on Calvary, think about it. After Christ having victory at Calvary, he ascends and comes back and says in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and on, on earth. And this package that he gives unto us, the package of justification, you notice that he fills all things. And the feeling of these things is to give gifts unto those who accept him. So the package of justification comes with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Are you seeing that? 
The package of justification comes with what? The gifts of the Holy Spirit. And this, so you know what God is seeking to restore to his church during the latter rain? When they have victory over sin? What is he seeking to restore to the church? Character, think about it. We have just read it. The gifts of the Holy Spirit. Are they missing in the church? And so how do we know that the latter rain is falling upon the people of God who have been justified? The apostolic life, the gifts are accompanying the, the third angel's message. Because we have seen that the third angel's message, justification by faith is the third angel's message in what? In verity and justification comes with Christ filling all things and restoring the gifts that are missing in the church. And so we see the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, pastors, and teachers. All these things come with the package of justification. How precious is the message? And how we are missing it. And it is just because of not surrendering fully to Christ. And he says that this is this justification that comes with the package, it is for perfecting the saints. For the work of the ministry. So ministration work cannot be carried without the gifts. Do you see that? Because the gifts comes, they perfect the church to the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ till we come into the unity of faith. Meaning that the last generation will be a united people. And what will unite them is the gift of justification coming with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then you will not hear one person speaking here one thing and another one speaking here another thing. They will all be united because they are justified with the same person who feels all things. And they have partaken of this divine nature. We miss out on these precious messages. And of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure and the stage of the fullness of Christ. This is what justification has to reproduce in our lives. Yet we see we still see ourselves far away from what actually this precious message brings into our life. The message of justification helps us to be victors in Christ, clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It is the third angel's message which is to be proclaimed with a loud cry and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. When we talk about large measure, and uh, coming to the full stature and the measure of uh, the man Jesus Christ. Look at the book of John. The book of John chapter 3. It's verses. Uh, I want you to look at uh, verses 30 to 36. That is John chapter 3, verses 30 to 36. We are talking about this precious gift, justification of precious gift. Are we there? Amen? Amen. Yes, let us read then. He must exist, but I must exist. Do you see how John starts his message? Mm -hmm. He must do what? Increase. I must decrease that he might do what? Yeah. If, you know, what is justification? It is the laying of the glory of man in dust. So I must decrease. He must increase. This is the laying of the glory of man in dust. Verses 31 read. He that comes from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthy and seeketh of the earth. He that comes from heaven is above all. 32. And what he has seen and heard, does he justify and no man is he that has received his testimony has said to his seal, there, to his seal, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaketh the word of God, for God giveth not to his spirit by nature. Pause a minute before you read 35 and 36. We saw that the third angel's message, under the ministration of the latter rain, we shall be given the spirit without measure. And that is why Christ says, that uh, uh, he who believes on me, he will even do greater works than 
than he did. Because he will have the fullness of Christ in him. And in Christ was all the gifts that every Christian needs to be able to live a righteous life and do all these works. And so he says that he that the father has sent, he giveth him the spirit without measure. Why is it that we are sent and we don't have the spirit without measure? Has really Christ sent us? Has God really sent us? We ask ourselves this question. There are challenges unto ourselves. If he says that him who God has sent, he giveth the spirit without measure, yet we see ourselves with spirit with measure. We have hardly reached a point that surrender has taken in our lives. Verses 35 and 36. The Father loveth the Son and has given all things into his hand. Yes. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Yes, so the Son has the life that we need. And that life we know that it is the Spirit of God that is able to give us everything we need. And so this message has to go all over the four corners of the world. And how is it to go? It has to go in the glory of God, which is manifested in the character of his children. It should be manifested in the character of his children. And so not only was it in the purpose of God to set this message to, of righteousness by faith before the church, it was given, it was to be given to the world. And so through the church, the world had to be a harvest field. And uh, I think Paul speaks of such a thing in one of his uh, writings where he talks about um, principalities. I'll, uh, I'll try to write this. In the New Testament, it is uh, in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, from uh, verses, th from verses uh, 7 to verses 12. I'd like us to read Ephesians chapter 3 from verses 7 to verses 12, where actually the Lord wants to do something for his church and use the church to do something for the world. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 7 to verses 12. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power, unto me who am less than the least of all saints. This grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsociable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world have been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent? To the intent that now and to the principalities and powers in heavenly places must be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the general purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of God. Yes, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church. What is a church? The pillar and ground of what? Of truth. So the Lord wants us to use us as a church to show something to the world by the gift, by his wisdom, by the grace, what he has done for us. In fact, um, when you go to uh, COL 415, I'd like you to see wh while we are talking about uh, the church being used to do something to the world, uh, COL 415. COL 415, up uh, from uh, paragraph 5. COL 415 from paragraph 5. I'll uh, read it to you. 
the, the Lord is intending to convert us and then use us for his work. Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, behold your God. Remember, look and live. Behold your word, your God. The last trace of merciful life, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory. That is the ministration of the latter rain. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The light of the sun of righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words of truth, and deeds of holiness. We are talking about the most, the precious gift that the Lord wants to give to his church. And he is giving unto the people who are ready to receive it. So it was not only the purpose of this message to be confined to the church, but it had to go to the whole world. And how is it to go to the whole world? It has to be attended to by the glory. Remember the words of Jesus Christ, is it in a, uh, Luke chapter 4, 18, how God anointed Jesus Christ, is it? How God anointed Jesus Christ and how he went about doing good, healing the sick and all doing all this work. The Lord wants to anoint us through just this justification. He wants to anoint us so that we may also go out doing the work. The message of 1888 was a precious message and it need to be reclaimed. It then needs to be repeated in a loud voice and it has to go to the four corners of the world. And so the Lord has dealt us with us in his mercy and be, been uh, patient enough. You know, one of the fruit of the spirit is patient. One of the fruits of the spirit is patient. And so the Lord has been patient enough with us. The testimony of the spirit of prophecy were received during the year 1887 gave a warning danger. They named again and again a specific evil, deception in which the church was falling. And what is this fatal mistake that was there? Men substituting the righteousness of Christ with ceremonies, machineries, activities, and men being taught to look unto men. And this has been the hindrance of the reception of the message, even today, individually and corporately. Men looking unto men and putting in the machinery so that they may be seen. You see how the church and the people compete with the world so that they may be seen. But what Christ needs is a simplicity in his people, a simplicity in faith in his people. That they have not to work the way the world works. It says, it is possible to be formal, partial believer, and yet be found wanting and lose eternal life. It is possible to practice some of Bible injunction and be regarded as Christian and yet perish because you are lacking in essential qualification that constitutes Christian character. We are not to think that uh, the Lord gives us favor because of the things we do for him. Like uh, if you want to prom be promoted at work, what do you do with study life? Sam, you want to be promoted, what do you do? You work hard, is it? And make sure everything is right, is it? Yeah, so that when your boss comes, everything is looking, hey, everything is okay. Then you are promoted. And sometimes even people get craft, is it? To be promoted. And so we have taken the methods of the world to think that this can appropriate unto us the gift of justification and be able to make us have favor before God. But this is not what the Lord needs. He doesn't want us to work the way the world works. He wants us to come to him and believe that he is a rewarder of them who seeks him diligently. And so the, the church has to step the ceremonies, the forms of ceremonies, and a mere profession of Christ and live out the message. It is not enough to perform this ceremony. There's too much formality in the church while souls are perishing for light 
and knowledge. And we have come to this point that uh, we can really bribe the church. And you know, we are told our come meetings as sessions that brings about latter rain, is it? Have we ever read these statements? Mm -hmm. Our come meetings are some of the sessions that the Lord will use to outpour the latter rain. Now think about the case. If this is the case that some of our come meetings are the sessions that the Lord will use to outpour the latter rain, how should they be conducted? Should they be just formal ceremonies that comes once in a year and then you have goals and then you have food and then you go home? They were meant to be sessions of evangelism, sessions of renewal, but people come even better and they go worse. People are not edified in these meetings because it is only formal ceremonies to please each other and to outdo each other. But the Lord is not calling us. He's calling us out of this formalism. And so the same issues that uh, affected the church in 1888 seems to be affecting the church today. They need to come out of this formalism. They need to come out with the uh, thinking that they can do anything that uh, can merit them the favor of justification. And uh, we have the issues even of baptism, where actually they are addressed in this message of righteousness by faith. Why do we even baptize the people? Have we ever thought about it? Is it just for a number or is it because Christ is working in their lives? This is another issue. And that is why the Lord is not working to bring many in, inside the church because there are people who profess to be Christians, but they are not Christians. And those who had been Christians, they have actually uh, fallen off. As we come to an end, the greatest need, this is the last part of it in the, this subject, uh, the precious gift of justification. What is the greatest need that the church needs? We are told a revival of true goodness among us is the greatest and most urgent of our needs. To seek this should be our first work. There must be honest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord, not because God is not willing to bestow his blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. This, this should be coming from a Christian service. Let me give you the page. THS. Page uh, 41 to 42. Now, we find that the third angel's message is to prepare people to stand before the Lord without an intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary. Amen? Yeah, if it could happen tomorrow, how many are prepared to stand before the Lord without an intercessor? Yet, we shall have an advocate, uh, a protector, but without an intercessor. So, Justification by faith is the third angel's message in verity. True? And the third angel's message is to prepare a people to stand before it's be, it is a, for the people to stand before the Lord without an intercessor. Which means justification by faith is a message of victory over sin. This precious gift is a package of victory over sin. And uh, we are told that uh, the Lord is willing to outpour his blessings upon the people, but they have placed hindrances before them. Now, do not wait to do the work corporately, but embark on it individually. Now, this doesn't sound good, is it? If we say that we enter into it individually, is it good news? <laughs> is it good news? 
But what if the family rejects justification by faith? Personal. Yeah, it is individual. Will your members of the, will the members of the family hinder you to make the steps needed? A revival of true goodness is what is needed among us as a people. Are we ready to seek it individually? Do you know what it means to seek it individually? And I know this is where now the rubber meets the road where actually people are married and all that stuff, is it? You're having children and you have to be involved in this and involved in that. How, how I, do I do this without my husband or without my wife or without my children? He says that enter the work individually. In the work of perfection, you cannot, character is not transferable. Okay? Can we transfer character? We cannot transfer character. So for how long should we linger to receive this message? Should we wait until everyone receives it? But this is what has been, you see people say, oh, you mean you have the truth? Has GC published it? Has so and so published it? Men had been taught to look unto what? To men, and this is what Christ wants to remove. He wants us to enter into the work individually. We have, we have far more to fear from within than from without. The hindrances to strength and success are far more greater from the church itself than from the world. So if we are waiting for the church to get hold of this message, then we will wait for another century. And so, uh, he says, there is nothing that Satan fears so much that the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance. What, what are the hindrances that are preventing us from receiving this justification, the gifts? You know yourself what is, what is hindering you. It is some personal thing that you have to decide in your life. The remedy is to accept Jesus Christ and let him lead all the way. There is a wide difference between profession of Christianity and Christianity. There is what? A wide what? Difference between what? Profession of Christianity and what? Christianity. And so many of the people profess Christianity. But when they are called upon to act upon that Christianity, they give excuse. And so the step, the first step that could have led them to victory is the very step that hinders them for their victory. When you are called to do or to make the first step, then you don't do it you are hindered. And as we reflect upon 1888, we have to ask one question. Do we have Jesus Christ in our heart? The package was that you are given victory over sin and it comes with all the gifts and the church is perfected and it comes into unity of faith and to the full measure of the son of God, even Jesus Christ. So the question that should be asked today as even we revisit 1888 messages, do I have Jesus Christ in my heart? This is not a question that should be answered by another person, but by you yourself. Do I have Jesus Christ? We should study the life of the Redeemer, for he is the only perfect example for men. And we should contemplate upon his precious promises that he has given unto us. Christ object lesson 333.3. Joel point three. In fact, just point one. I'm sorry. Point one. Change it to point one. Three 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 point one. I'd like to leave you with these promises. I want somebody from the congregation to read it. Mm -hmm. 
that uh, as the will of man cooperates with the will of who? It becomes what? What is omnipotent? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, is it? So you can put that besides Philippians 4.13. As the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. That is why Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is the message of justification. That is the precious gift. Whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his word, strength. All his beatings are his enablings. So let us not fear what Satan is doing in this world. We can go into prophecies and see what is happening there in USA and other parts of the world. Right now, as you people understand, California is burning down. Right now. Yes. Haven't you seen the news? Oh, you try, you sold your TVs. Praise the Lord. Because it is another hindrance. And why is that region of the world burning down? Because of Sodom and bestiality. You cannot say those are not judgments. California was the first city to pass the law of bestiality. There is marriage of human and animals in the USA. And the Lord cannot forbear. It gave, it gave it some time to repent, but things are just going on normal. And the whole of USA is burning down. And the reason where we are going, she says in Great Converse, as this calamity increases, then the people shall demand for the nation to go back to morality. This is antithesis. And when they do that, it is the people who will actually ask for Sunday law. They will say that the morals have gone down. What we need is to return to God. Then what? Have a day of worship. And so I don't want to go to prophecies, but I want you to look at what Christ is doing. While the world is starting to receive its judgments, the church should be learning its position in the world. It should be... And we are told that um, clad in what? A statement. Clad in the armor of God. This is the last statement I'm reading. The church has to go forth as a, what? Yes, this is from uh, my life today, ML starting from page 311. I'll read this quote and then we close with a word of prayer. We can read together if you can find it in your devices. But if you can find it, I'll go ahead and read it. Mm -hmm. ML 311, starting from paragraph two. While we are seeing evil happening in the world, the church has to understand it is calling at that point. It says, clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness, the church is to enter her what? Do we see the final conflict? We are, we, we are being told that um, in the final conflict, we will see wars and rumors of what? Wars, pestilences, false Christs. We shall see floods. The church has to end its final conflict. And when you see these things, know that your redemption draweth what? Draweth nice. So she says that clad in the arm of Christ's righteousness, as we see evil, in fact, the only thing that should spur us to righteousness is the evil that exists in this world. It will be a point that will call to attention the other people who are doing evil. If they see a people who are living differently, Clad in the arm of Christ's righteousness, the church is to end upon her final conflict. Fair as the moon, clearer as the sun, and terrible as army with banners, she is to go forth into all the world doing what? Conquering to? Yeah, like the first church which received the early rain. You see what it did? In only three years, Paul says that the whole world had heard the message. Every creature 
under heaven had heard the message. In three years, imagine. But that was early rain, you see? The latter rain falls in double measure, which means that the period will be shorter because it will be, we are told it is a greater work, but in a small time. Only the covering which Christ himself has provided can make us meet to appear in God's presence. This covering the robe of his own righteousness, Christ will put upon every repenting, believing soul. I counsel thee, he says, to buy of me white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. This is the message to Laodicea, is it? So the message of justification by faith is meant for Laodicea and no other person. All our righteousness are what? As filthy rags. Everything that we of ourselves can do is defiled by sin. But the Son of God was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Sin is defined to be transgression of the law, but Christ was obedient to every requirement of the law. So we are told that the justification by faith was to bring the uplifted Savior, and it's the third angel's message in surety, which preaches obedience to all the commandments of God. And what do we do? When we submit ourselves to Christ, we live his life. Amen? Amen. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Then as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment. Genesis chapter 3, is it? Where we started. Not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. Lastly, to everyone, God has made an offer that will help to brace every nerve and spiritual muscle for the time to test of taste that is to come to all of us. So justification by faith cancels the mark of the beast. It is the one that prepares to receive the seal of God and avoid the mark of the beast. Justification by faith, not any other thing. I am charged with the message, clothe yourself with the arm of Christ's righteousness. And having done all you can do on your part, you have the assurance of victory. To every soul is granted the gracious opportunity of standing on the rock of ages. So justification by faith is to make us stand before the test which is before us. Victory over sin is what will make us not receive the mark of the beast. So. The Lord be with us as uh, we contemplate upon these messages. And then we shall pray and uh, take uh, the questions. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much because you have given us the gift of eternal salvation through your son. Without his righteousness, then, we cannot be able to enter in heaven. And so I thank you because you are making it possible for us to see the rich promises you have given us into your word. You say that in every command, there's a blessing. And in every command obeyed, Lord, we are made omnipotent. And so help us to grasp this message, to look and live just as the Israelites in the wilderness looked and lived. We thank you so much for thy guidance and we thank you for thy love in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.